if someone gets an MRI and they find a growth in their body, should they watch it carefully, biopsy it, or have surgery to remove it? Yeah, it depends on what it is. Um, but um, there is an, an argument out there that um, everybody should get a total body scan every year or whatever intervals. Um, and again, hey, that kind of makes sense. Gee, you know, what a good idea. Um, why don't we just MRI everybody's whole body every year? And as soon as we see a lump, we take it out. Then nobody would ever get cancer. It doesn't work like that. Um, because what would happen is that we would have a whole lot of operations. It would end up being like the South Korean thyroid problem, where everyone's getting the thyroid taken out and nobody's getting better because of it. And a lot of people are getting worse. Um, and so it would lead to a whole lot of surgery and it, and it wouldn't help people. That's a difficult concept to get across. There's lots of reasons for it. Um, one reason for it is this, um, this effect in screening. So we're talking really about a screening program where at, at, at intervals we screen people for something. And it, this is you know, mastectomy, uh, 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 mammogram screening programs. There's, there's uh, colon cancer screening programs. There's lots of screening programs out there. But let me tell you the problem with them, if you, if you did it on that scale, you have to show me that the screening program works. And there are trials you can do. There's randomized trials where they test hundreds of thousands of women, for example, uh, where they randomize them to either having regular mammograms or just leaving them alone. Um, and that's the evidence that you need to show that it's effective. And interestingly, in, in, in some of those studies that have been done in, in, uh, for mammograms have not shown a significant difference in mortality, in, in death rates. Um, by having the mammogram. Sure, you pick up a lot more cancers, but you don't save more lives. Partly because the cancers that kill you are the bad ones. And bad cancers come on very quickly. And so if you've got a really bad cancer that's aggressive, it's going to grow and you're going to pick up the lump and you're going to have surgery on it, that's going to happen in a matter of months. And that'll probably happen between your second yearly mammographies. Um, and if you have a mammography every second year, the probability of picking up one of those cancers is very low. But the probability of picking up a cancer that was never going to kill you anyway because it was so slow growing is very high. Every two years, you're going to pick up that cancer. You could leave it alone, do another scan another two years, you're going to see it again. So you're always going to pick up those cancers. You're not going to pick up these aggressive cancers that just come on like that, accelerate, and kill you. So prostate cancer is probably a good one because we know that's a highly aggressive cancer that, that kills people very quickly. I mean, it's, it's, it's a terrible cancer to have. But if you screened everybody every year for prostate cancer, you'd probably miss all of those because they would come in between the screenings um, or, or you'd catch them when it's too late. You, you'd see it and you go, yeah, you've got this terrible prostate cancer. Sorry, there's not much we can do about it. So yeah, you've picked it up, but you haven't saved anybody. So how do you know when to have surgery and when not to have it? That's the, that's the trick. And that's why we have such a problem with surgery. We have huge geographic variations in surgery. We have huge intersurgeon variation in, in when people operate and when people don't. And, and for many common conditions that I see as an orthopedic surgeon, uh, uh, broken heel bones, broken collarbones, uh, shoulder pain, knee pain from degenerative menisci, even osteoarthritis, just very common conditions. You get some surgeons who will you know, operate on nearly every patient and you get other surgeons who don't operate on nearly every patient. So um, that's the difficult bit is working out when we should operate and when we shouldn't. That's why we need studies that tell us what is uh, the, the benefit of doing surgery in this particular circumstance and, and do those benefits outweigh the, the, the risks and, and what are the relative benefits compared to not operating? Um, it's a very difficult question to answer because it depends on, on the individual condition um, that the patient has, but that's the difficult question to answer. Which surgeries do you feel best about and which do you feel are the most unnecessary. Yeah, I've mentioned cataract surgery. In my own field, which is orthopedic surgery, uh, you know, there's lots of very uh, helpful uh, procedures. Um, you know, hip replacement and knee replacement are effective operations. There's 
perhaps some evidence that knee replacement uh, at least is perhaps a little bit overdone. And the evidence I use for that is that it varies a lot between countries. So even in, in, in you know, what we call developed countries or you know, modern countries where access to healthcare is not, a, not an issue, you have huge variation in the rates. So even where I, I live you know, in Australia, Australia and New Zealand are very similar economies. They're both very rich countries. Um, you know, everybody's covered with health insurance. It's, if, if you need a knee replacement, there's no problem getting it. Um, there's no shortage of orthopedic surgeons. There's no shortage of hospitals. Um, but the rates of surgery for knee replacement vary between those two countries, uh, where we do a lot more in Australia than they do in New Zealand. Um, and that's not always explained by differences in the population. Um, so yeah, I think that that's an effective operation. I, personally, I do a lot of uh, hip fracture surgery. So, so elderly uh, uh, people who come in after a fall and they break their hip, I think that's a fairly effective operation. Studies have shown that, that, that we, we operate on them. We can get them walking straight away, get them home early. They don't have to, in the old days, they'd be lying around in hospital in traction for, for three or six months, which is a terrible way of treating anybody. Um, so yeah, there's lots of effective surgeries, but, but there's lots of ineffective surgeries. I think there's some that have been shown to be ineffective um, that, that I've already mentioned, um, but there's probably some out there that we just don't know whether they're effective or not because they haven't been tested properly. Are surgeries governed by a government agency or is it up to each individual doctor? It varies a lot between jurisdictions or between countries. So um theoretically you know, surgeons can do wh whatever they want you know surgeons have a, uh, a procedure that they want to do you know for whatever tennis elbow or shoulder bursitis or hip bursitis or or anything they want um they can develop a procedure and they they, they can do it and often surgeons do but um if they want it to be covered by insurance then in Australia, for example, it needs to be on the, on the, on the schedule, what we call the schedule or the list of, of approved procedures that, that carry a rebate. And if you make up a procedure that's not covered by that, um, you can do it, but the patient has to pay you out of their own pocket. It's not going to get reimbursed by their health insurer or, or the government. Um, and, I, and I imagine, you know, systems are reasonably similar around the world. Um, so surgeons get a lot of flexibility about when to operate uh, and, and what they do, but um, it, it's more difficult for them to get the patients to do it um, if it's uh, not covered uh, by their insurer. Mm -hmm.